Okay, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Neil Patton. I'm the president of the Bendigo Amateur Radio and Electronics Club, and I'd like to welcome you all this evening. This is quite a good turnout. There are a few familiar faces and a few unfamiliar ones, so welcome to all of you. Thank you for making the time to come and see us this evening. Now, we're here this evening to talk about STEAM and the future of STEAM education in central Victoria. That's why we're here. Now, STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, Mathematics. STEAM is about skills required to achieve real-world outcomes. STEAM is how society provides for itself. STEAM is everywhere. The, outcome of STEAM, the outcomes of STEAM are to be found in every corner of our lives. But most importantly, STEAM is a way of thinking. Students of STEAM identify a problem. Then they create a solution to that problem. Then they test their solution. Then they, uh, then they test it again in, in an iterative process of improvement. STEAM teaches inquiry, critical thinking, and perseverance. It could be argued that these skills are more vital to society now than any, any other time in our history. So STEAM is about knowledge and skills. And knowledge can be achieved through study, but incorporating STEAM education into our schools, I'm wondering why I'm having trouble reading this. I haven't got my glasses on, no wonder. Excuse me a second. That's better, right. Now, knowledge can be achieved through study, but incorporating STEAM education in our schools requires support for educators in delivering skills. The university courses now encourage teachers to contextualise scientific concepts by using locally available resources and examples and opportunities. There are government initiatives seeking to deliver STEAM skills through industry partnerships. Now, these are great if you have local industries that are willing to participate, but not all communities do. So something's missing. In the absence of industry, the community itself must become part of this context equation. And if that's true, then the very notion of context needs to be reframed. STEAM must be taught in a way that addresses the needs and reflects the values and draws on resources of the community. Now, Amateur Radio has been contextualising STEAM and mentoring young people for over 100 years. Well, many of you would never have heard of it. But as scientists and technologist enthusiasts ourselves, radio amateurs routinely break new ground in experimentation and innovation and design. STEAM is what we do. The Bendigo Amateur Radio and Electronics Club is Central Victoria's leading technology not-for-profit with many lifetimes of STEAM expertise. Would all the amateur radio operators in the room please raise their hand? Thank you. There's, it's hundreds of years. It's hundreds of years. And as part of a community with a proud heritage of technical skills and mentoring, we recognise our obligation to pay forward the learning opportunities that were afforded to us. This is why Barrick has written into its strategic plan a commitment to technological literacy. Barrick's school-based learning program in electronics has been enthusiastically received by students and teachers and parents alike. We've proven the concept and we are now ready to expand the program so that more schools can become involved. There'll be more on that shortly. Barrick also has a policy to support what we call complementary technology communities. These are any community-based organisations with an interest in technology. The Castlemaine Electronics Workshop has recently emerged quite spontaneously from the very fabric of Castlemaine's artistic culture and shares many of our goals. Barrick is pleased to be able to lend our expertise to their initiative and we welcome the opportunity to do so. In a moment, I'll hand over to Sash Moti from the Castlemaine Electronics Workshop. Tony Fowler will then explain the history of our school-based learning program. Our Vice President, Michael Tobin, will then have a few words to say about the Barrack training team. And then we will have a short graduation ceremony for the 14 participants 
of Barracks 2020-2021 Amateur Radio course to welcome them to the Amateur Radio community. We'll then break for supper and you can view the displays and ask any questions you wish about what you see. Thank you again for coming. Sash, over to you. I didn't expect to be doing this in a scout hut. I was a bit worried actually, because I'm not sure I'm supposed to be allowed in here. I uh, actually burnt down my scout hut when I was uh, in the Cubs. I uh, set fire to the pool table. So um, my name's Sash, and uh, as you might have gathered by now, I'm actually from Manchester. And I've been here nine years, and uh, the accent's still not gone away. So let's see. Um, I am technically the committee president. Um, there's about four, how many is in there now? About six, six of us, five. It's growing and increasing all the time in the committee, but there's actually about 33 members of us now. We, uh, I'll go through the mission statement. So Q is an independent, inclusive, and culturally broad collective of electronic musicians and sound makers based in Castlemaine on Jar Jar Wurrung country. Q creates a social hub that facilitates the exchange of skills and resources across all aspects of electronic sound and music production for people creating at all levels. And Q aims to showcase the innovation and creativity within the community and build the capacity of emerging talent. Now we came to this mission statement uh, after a very long process of whittling it down. What are we? What do we want to do? What do we want to get out of this? Um, and that was initially, it took us about eight weeks and lots and lots of people that we reached out to and we finally whittled it down to those couple of sentences. Now, um, I suppose the story starts with um, I am or have been a professional musician and a radio DJ and a club DJ for the majority of my adult life, I would say, since certainly since I was about 15 years old. And um, during COVID last year, I'm sure like many of you, um, I got to reassess where I was at and what I was doing, what I wanted to do. And uh, I started to go, well, I need to sort of, um, am what's the word, amplify, better my skills that I've actually got. And I picked up a program called Ableton, which enables um, you to be able to make music electronically on computers. And then um, that cost me 600 bucks. And that was a COVID deal. And then I had to buy all the peripherals and that cost another 400 bucks. And then I had to figure out how to use it. And then I started thinking to myself, God, you've got to be quite privileged and quite rich, really, to be able to get off the ground with this. So I um, actually just read um, about the Get Lost initiative in, I think it was the Castle Main Mail. And uh, I applied for a grant. I wasn't, don't even know why I did it, actually, but I did it and I got it. And it was a small little grant. And um, yeah, it was the little Get Lost initiative. So here we are. And it, the Get Lost initiative um, is a little new initiative that's still going actually at the moment uh, to foster emerging creative businesses and activities and surely in response to COVID. So, um, and as you can see there, there's, there's me in the middle, but uh, around the outside of it, there are the, all the other artistic projects that have been ignited um, due to Get Lost. There's plenty more than that as well, a fantastic um, opportunity. With the small grant that Q got, so far we've been able to develop the brand identity and its assets. So one of the very first things I did was enable us to have some clear identity. So once people knew what it actually was, we could get off the ground a bit better. Um, in, in fact, I think the very first thing I did was get the logo. And uh, with, I did that by employing a local artist called Vincent Casey. Um, and actually from that, quite a lot of things started to happen just because we had a logo. Um, then, as I said before, we formulated the mission statement, and that was um, 
I reached out to the local community. Uh, my initial idea actually was to get one or two artists in from Melbourne who were electronic artists who could uh, show us exactly what they do um, because it's all very mysterious um, and then it turned into there's loads and loads of bedroom boffins mucking around with beat machines and synthesizers in Castle Maine. There's a hotbed of talent going on. So uh, I started a little network. Um, I used Slack actually, um, which was, it was good to start with, certainly, and Slack is like an online workspace and we can all go in there and help each other and ask questions um, that are technical questions or even indeed to help organize events. Um, speaking of events, after we got a good identity together and we're fairly confident of moving forward, we launched ourselves and we did that at Boomtown Wines. Um, and where we got local artists to play. And all of the artists that played that night, I'm pretty sure, were Q members. Uh, Nick himself performed at the back, who's here. Um, Marcus, did you, did you perform? No. No, you didn't, did you? But you were working on the stage, weren't you? Yeah, so I, I should have introduced uh, Marcus and Nick are, are also here uh, from uh, the Castlemaine Electronic Workshop, as is Lisa down here on the front. Feel free to approach us with any questions. Um, yes, we had the launch at Boom Time Wines and we raised a little bit more cash and um, that enabled us to move forward and incorporate ourselves officially as a not-for-profit organization. And then we reached out to Barak, or it might have even been Barak that reached out to us. Can't even remember, actually. Tony, did you reach out to us or did I? I think, oh, well, no, Marcus. Um, He's a radio amateur, you see. That's how we met Marcus. And then we joined forces. Well, there we go. Uh, um, we popped on down to uh, the Bendigo headquarters of Barrack and we asked them, well, how did you do it? How did you formalize it? How did you get off the mark? Um, so, and from then on, we've been able to associate um, quite nicely with each other and help each other out, and hence tonight. Um, hopefully moving forward we'll be able to share all of our um, resources uh, and I've got broken, broken headphones, it's like a massive, massive head. Um, volunteer activities, it doesn't actually run on grant money at all, in fact it runs on about like 10%, 20% of it so far has been run on volunteer money even though that we are applying for grants and we're quite hopeful that we're going to get some grants, we've at the moment only really received that first grant. We've, had, we've been in talks with uh, Creative Victoria and uh, Music Victoria and uh, they're very keen on what we're doing and uh, certainly in light of not just helping artists get off the ground um, in central Victoria but also in terms of creating a, a foundation for STEM or STEAM, should I say. So some of the volunteer activities that we've been doing is that uh, we've had some live jams that Marcus really has been totally facilitating off his own back. Um, he just went up and did it and just went, well, I'm just gonna go and take some synthesizers down the park and we'll try and encourage some people to join us, which made it happen. And we met so many people. In fact, our latest member um, is a a uh, Japanese lady who, who produced uh, soundscapes who was walking past us in the park and is now joined up and wants to uh, help us and be involved. Pardon? With the theremin. With the theremin, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and she actually turned up with her baby and uh, we just totally encouraged the baby to, you can't break them really, just go and have a go and have a slide and it was just fantastic, it was a wonderful day. So, and then the other thing that we've done, we've only managed to do one of this, but we really want to do more of it, is uh, soldering nights. Um, and we've got our little projects, some of which we've brought in tonight, and we literally just went round to Marcus's again. <laughs> and um, his good lady wife made us all a hell of a lot of tacos. That was fantastic. And, um, and then we just sat up all night learning about each other's projects, helping each other with what we were doing. Um, and it was just really, we want to do more of that, so. Um, 
moving forward in the future, things that have, have happened and are indeed happening at the moment, uh, we've sort of decided to uh, split our projects up. We've got software um, synthesized development, which is happening with Nick at the back. And then we've got hardware synthesized development, which is happening with Marcus. Um, <coughs> uh, we didn't in actually include you, Lise, but Lise is actually doing a, a lot of audio, audio visual stuff for us as well. Um, and um, it's certainly given us a larger presence, um, not, on, not just on the stage, but also on the internet, with really professional looking audio visual products. Thank you, Lise. Um, so, Speaking of which, we've just created and launched today the YouTube channel with several short experiments with tech videos. So uh, Nick's done a few at, at home, but this week we've been lucky enough to uh, get all the equipment together and uh, Craig has been helping us film there with us as well. And we've got some uh, in the pipeline, some videos to go, but we've just launched two today on YouTube. Um, we also have managed to do two newsletters. Actually, we've done two events, and I personally think that newsletters are the hardest things to do. <laughs> it's just when it comes to the end of the quarter, you should be chipping away at it all the time, or else there's, there's a lot to do. If you want to sign up to the newsletter, please pass me your, um, or Marcus, or Nick, your email, and we'll sign you up, by the way. Um, Q has applied for more funding uh, to help us move to the next phase of research, planning, design and development. Uh, just incidentally, those uh, photographs are from the filming this week that we did. Um, so uh, this includes a business plan that articulates and refines our operations, uh, proposed products and services with market research, goals, strategies and a financial plan. Sounds very highfalutin, but it's actually, um, if we can just get um, all our ideas into a ballpark area and try and not monetize it in order to secure a future. So with the prototypes that we are developing that we mentioned before, the hardware and the software, they should be teachable. Those should be things that we can all build together in workshops. Um, and therefore moving forward, know how to make great music with and pass on to our uh, friends and families. Um, designs and costings for a shared studio where event planning, music collaborations and product development and workshops can happen. Now, uh, what I should have mentioned earlier on that is a major influence in what we're doing is, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, MESS, but MESS is Melbourne Electronic Sound Studios in Melbourne, which is currently one of the world's best collections of synthesizers and electronic music um, equipment. So much so that Google has um, got in touch with them and has photographed every single bit of machinery that they've got, and now you can go and do a virtual tour of their studio. Um, as uh, we, we all know, Australia has actually been one of the hotbeds of uh, homemade synthesis and um, certainly needs um, a little bit more of a spotlight on it. But when I say that it's been an influence on us, I attended these workshops and went, well, why can't we do that? Because there's a couple of people up here that um, have some amazing synthesizers. Let's just share what they know and share what they have. And um, yeah. So development of a STEM workshop plans with costings to be shovel ready for funding opportunities. So um, actually I did forget to mention that, that on that last point, that shared studio is actually the, is a biggie. It's really very difficult to actually figure out how we're gonna do it. How are we going to end up in one spot where we can have our workshops, uh, our solder equipment just available in one spot and safe as well. Um, and we do need a home and somewhere that we can go to um, at any time and be a safe space for anybody that wants to come in and enjoy or learn and share um, electronic music. Uh, the development of hardware designs and prototypes for testing. I think that's just basically a reiteration of the software uh, and hardware that Nick and 
uh, markets are predominantly um, developing. Who um, I will get to chat real briefly at the end about. Is that okay? Yeah? Sorry to spring that on you, but unless you want to do it, people get, come up here and tell everybody what you're doing afterwards, five yeah. minutes. Yeah? yeah? Um, sorry. <laughs> Q is excited to be piloting electronic workshops at DigiClub this next term at the Good Shed Arts. Now, um, the events that we have done, so we did the launch at Boomtown Wines, but we also did one at uh, Campbell's Creek Community Centre, which actually, if you were ever going to book that for an event, was fantastic. The acoustics were amazing. Um, so um, from the, the money that we made at those um, events, um, we... Uh, putting towards our workshops. This is what we're doing. This is the Cast Main Electronic Workshop. We're trying to get people to come along, kids, um, LGBTIQ, um, indigenous people, um, and to come along. Those that are not represented at all by uh, um, those that make electronic music or even might find it hard to get involved with electronic music. I did mention at the beginning that it was quite an expensive thing to be getting involved with. So, um, sorry to go back to this, um, DigiClub, um, which is something that Lisa um, actually has already been running for an audio audiovisual. Did you want to chat a little bit about that at the end or? Oh, oh maybe, yeah, yeah, could yeah. do. Yeah, because it'd be great to tell some of the young people here as well that um, yeah. uh, we got funded by, with Gus Main State Festival, we got funded to, um, to do a range of courses for adults as well as for youth. And this is, um, this is the first sort of pilot sort of program that we've got um, running there. And we're going to invite Q and hopefully Tony Feller and, you know, to come in as well for a session. And just to really um, get kids hands, hands on and to do, to use this as well to then, you know, document it and go for more funding. Yeah. yeah. And this um, audio visual digi club that um, Lisa has run, which essentially is already STEM, you're already doing it really. So we're jumping on your coattails, really, uh, is um, what she's doing here is the, with um, Leone, Leone at the front, is uh, showing the kids a little bit of a, um, a, the Adobe. Yeah, we, did, we went through a few of the Adobe um, programs. So, like so most mostly most uh, Premiere and also Photoshop, um, to, but also just um, and After Effects which was yeah. for, um, we did sort of like green, green screen mm. and stop frame animation, which was heaps of fun. Which was an after school thing, uh, which is still going to be an after school thing. And certainly yeah. my daughter uh, and her best friend um, attended the Digi Club and now um, they've got this wonderful animation that's so quirky and lovely. Um, so thank you, Lise. Um, so essentially that's what we're going to jump on the coattails of um, and it's going to be where we first have a go at um, our electronic workshops. So this is where we're going to really try and trial things out and nut it out and make mistakes and try and learn from them. So um, we will introduce the young people to basic soldering, circuit building, sound wave manipulation, live mixing visuals and electronic music making. This will be partly funded by Regional Development Victoria, Storyland and Q Volunteer Power. Do you, can, should we describe what Storyland is? Uh, no, that's all right. Well, Storyland is, is just, um, it's a, um, it's like a media hub that's in Moston Street. Um, graphic designers and web developers and filmmakers. So we've been there for a couple of years now and we're doing all right. We won a Mount Alexander Business Award and um, it's also a place where we can run workshops from as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the one advantage of standing here and chatting in front of you is that I'm actually stood in front of the heater. Mm -hmm. Ha ha. Uh, so anyway, that's it. So if you've got any questions for me before I hand over to Marcus and Nick, feel free. I'm here. Don't be scared. <laughs> I'm all right. Anyway, thanks very much for your time, uh, Marcus and Nick from the Electronic Workshop. Whenever they're ready. I'm Marcus. I'm part of CEW and Barrack, um, and I came to uh, Barrack because I'd, I'd had radios before and wanted to get further into radio building, and 
I just started turning up to meetings and found out how to get my uh, foundation call sign. And over the COVID break, I managed to do all the exam and I got my call sign. Um, I'm VK3 FACI. I, I'm not very active at the moment, but I do spend as much time as I can building radios and trying to keep the antenna up, which is difficult when you've got kids who have a basketball ring in the same space. Um, I've, I've managed to build a couple of small radios. I've built um, some uh, CW Pixies. I've built a heap of those. They're just so easy to build and, and also explode. They take quite a lot of power. I found out they don't take any more than 12 volts and I've still got two left. <laughs> <laughs> I've also built some, I've built the, the, uh, a couple of rock mites and they're a lot finer. The receivers are a lot cleaner. They don't pick up as much trash and the noise floor is a lot lower. That was, that was, that was a, lot, a little bit more difficult, but it was a lot more fun. Um, and they only take nine volts. But anyway, um, uh, also in, in, in that building, um, what sort of, went in parallel development with the radios was, was building synthesizers. And um, I, I've always had a fascination for analog synthesizers, drum machines, samplers, uh, digital stuff is great, but, but hardware has always been my focus because it's there, you can touch it, you can put your hands on it. And building stuff makes it a lot more accessible. You, you can take a few components throw them together and before you know it, you're making strange sounds and annoying everyone. And sometimes you can't hear anything, but the dog certainly can. And you know, you don't, you don't know. Um, and through, through, through building um, these, these circuits and, and talking to a lot of people about how things are built, it really expanded my understanding of sound synthesis, of, about how radio works about you know electromagnetic frequencies how different frequencies are developed how noise is removed how um, certain textures are achieved how um, isolation needs to be made that some circuits won't just work on a positive and negative rail you need you know a, a negative voltage a positive voltage and a, and a neutral voltage like having a bipolar power supply um, really changed my understanding of, of how oscillators or, or other sound generation work. Uh, it sort of led into more valve stuff, but I don't really understand valve stuff at all. Um, and through, through working with Sash and doing the gigs and um, you know, coming up with more ideas all the time, um, we, we were talking about different ideas to you know, give people more access or to use in education. And one of the ideas was, well, why don't we print our own circuit boards? Uh, being a subscriber for Hackaday, a lot of people talked about using Eagle One or um, a lot of the, I can't think of the other, KiCad um, software for designing your own PCBs. Um, and my idea was to use our own PCBs as a business marketing tool, as a educational tool. It's it's cool to have your own PCBs that you made yourself. So that's how I started uh, with the oscillator project. It's just a, a A-stable multivibrator uh, oscillator. So it just uses two transistors, two capacitors. It's got five resistors, a diode, an LED, uh, variable resistor, and I've got output there as well. And that just runs off DC power. I defined the right transistors to run off a low, a low voltage, but they were very common, easy to get and cheap. Um, our proposed circuit, the, the first circuit that we want to build is just a si simple drone circuit using three A-stable multivibrators and putting inline filters as well to add mo more control and texture to the sound because basically it's just a square wave and you know, the square wave is quite harsh to listen to. But if you pass that through a simple LC filter, it changes it slightly to resemble, it's not a pure saw wave or it's not a saw wave. It's, it's sort of like a saw wave and it sounds nice. Um, it's a good fun project. It's easy. It's, it's got a lot of variables so you can change what each oscillator on the circuit board does. You could 
patch it up to do different things. Anyway, it could go on. It's, it's, it's got a lot of scope. You could just use it to build one of the oscillators. You could use it to build three. You could do whatever you wanted. Um, so yeah, we started by prototyping on breadboard. I personally don't like prototyping on breadboard. I find Vero board more fun, more solid, um, because you're soldering the connections in rather than just plopping them in. But it's easier to get people to follow your um, uh, example with a breadboard. You, you're not burning fingers. It's 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 fairly quick. Um, yeah, that's that's about it. That's you know, what else do I have to say? Has anyone got any questions? Huh? Yes? What's a multi-guide rotor? Ah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's two um, waveforms that are feeding into each other. And one switching on while the other switching off. And then that current that's spilling over switches the other one on and that one switches off. So it's like wobbling, yep, flip-flopping, oscillating, yep, vibrating. <laughs> Wish we had an oscilloscope. I could... <laughs> yeah. Does that explain it? Okay, cool. Yep. Um, there's a, for this circuit, um, an excellent example is in the old Dick Smith's fun way into electronics um, and I, I use that I used a more modern reprint that's it's called fun way into electronics not Dick Smith's fun way and it's available at JCAR but you can also buy it off eBay for really cheap but yeah the the example for this is is in that um, is in that book yes there's one more question I love it only audible frequencies, but I mean, if you change the voltage, the capacitors and the resistors, you can bring the frequency up or down. But yeah, if you change, if you change the voltage, then you need to change the transistors. But yeah, it's actually not that hard. You just got to find what frequencies you want. What frequencies would you be looking for? So this one here works between, uh, what is it? Between 2000 and uh, it goes down to uh, like 800. Yeah, hertz, that's it. Yes. Uh, well, I started doing kit electronics with a similar kit to the one in the wooden box up the back there from Tandy when I was seven, six or seven, eight, seven or eight. Yeah, seven or eight. Yeah, yeah, yep. And it was other hams that got me into it as well. And they were hams that were also CBers. So yeah, it was, it was radio. Yeah. And there's that, you know, like technology was different when I was seven or eight, as it would have been when you were seven or eight. And radio was this amazing world. Like, yeah, there, there were mobile phones around, they were huge, but radio was still cooler. And I still think it is because you're making a point to point transmission, not through somebody else's network that you have to pay an exuberant price for. Well, now we don't have the financial price, we have a data price, which is different. <laughs> yeah. Also space. If anyone here is obsessed with space, uh, you'd probably understand. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks. Hello, my name's Nick. Um, I'm a member of Castleman Electronic Workshop and uh, my background's in music, synthesizers, samplers, drum machines, all that sort of stuff. Um, more recently, I've been doing live coding using programming languages to make music on the fly. And that kind of led me into the project that I'm doing now. I'm using the same piece of software um, and I'm building a wavetable synthesizer for Q. Um, it's using physical computing. So I have a Raspberry Pi running 
Pure Data, which is an open source programming environment for audio. And then I'm using um, analog to digital converters and stuff like that to get um, a physical interface. My, my idea is um, to have a little screen with two knobs like an Etch-a-Sketch where you draw in your waveform and then oscillate that and you can have MIDI inputs, control voltage, control voltage input and um, you know, physical input using a pot as well. So at the moment, um, we're recording this as a YouTube series of the build, um, stage by stage. Um, we've got one video building the software engine in Pure Data, another video um, having a crack at analog input, um, and then another one looking at getting that data out to the screen and representing the waveform. And the next step is to start using some rotary encoders, um, real-time input, and then uh, yeah, then synchronization with other pieces of equipment. Um, it's over at the back there in the corner, so I'm happy to have a chat with anybody, anyone about it. Um, essentially, I think it'll be a, a unit that has the oscillator, maybe a filter, and then your, your inputs and outputs for synchronization and audio. Um, that's about it for me. Is there any questions about that? Um, if you want to have a, have a look afterwards, um, I've got the, the patch up there with the, the oscillator and the, you can draw in a waveform and hear it, um, and the Python script to let it communicate with the, the proto board. So yeah, come and have a chat if you'd like. Thank you. Well, thanks to CWQ for their presentation. And I'd like to say how impressed I was by their turnout at the uh, Campbell's Creek Hall. We went along, uh, there were four radio amateurs there, so we've got members in common. Uh, there were a load of youngsters there, uh, some of them so keen to be involved that they came on their own. And uh, I was impressed by that. Um, your second newsletter is good as well. Sash, there he is. Yes, I enjoyed the newsletter, so that's online as well, if you want to, um, as he said, subscribe to that. And a big thanks to the Scouts who have let us have the hall tonight. I'm happy to be interrupted by questions or corrections, because some of the information I haven't quite got about our timelines. We've been well, I've been connected with the uh, Scouts since 2014, as I discovered with my badge collection over there. I, I, I didn't realize it was as long as that. My talk will be in two parts. The first part will be um, my experience with Barrack's efforts to engage the wider community in its activities. So the history up to this point, and I'll also report on the combined current activities with Q which includes setting up new facilities to enable that to happen. First, a bit of a disclaimer. We in no way want to suggest that nothing is happening in the Shire regarding technology. And we want to acknowledge the excellent work being done by others in many of our schools and organizations. For instance, I've met the new STEAM teacher up at the secondary school. They've got a big um, technology precinct up there. I know there's a person helping at the Chewton Primary School. They make art out of discarded electronics. And that person also works with a repair cafe as well here in, in Castlemaine. And so there's overlaps all over the place. And I've also seen an article in the newspaper about the technology building at the, uh, that's going to be proposed at the Steiner School. The list goes on. Our only aim is to pass on our skills and offer our support, obtained, as Neil said, over many years, to whoever we can. Most of my colleagues will have a story about who was someone special in their lives who got them into amateur radio and electronics. And in my case, it was my parents. Three years after this picture was taken, I was taking apart ex-army radios my dad brought home from work. 
And I was astonished when my mother helped me to build my first crystal set. And I was surprised until she told me that she'd been in charge of a direction finding station in the Second World War. So she'd been trained up in electronics at Oxford University. And the fact that my dad brought home spy radios to try out utterly convinced me to take up the radio as a hobby. And I can tell you what he got up to after the Second World War as well sometime if you're interested. Radio is everywhere, including mobile phones, Wi-Fi, broadcast radio and TV, GPS, Bluetooth, the list goes on. People say radio is over, it's rubbish. It's in everything we do. And none of it would be possible without electronics. There would also be little music heard without recording equipment, amplifiers, PAs, and little generated without synthesizers and other musical equipment, all of them depending on electronics. And as you know, we've let other countries take over all the work of designing, construction and marketing to the detriment of our own industries. And eBay, just Chinese stuff, we, we're all buying Chinese stuff. Nobody's making radio equipment. Inevitably, the need for Australian trained engineers has diminished. But with the current health crisis and the shortage of products coming into the country at the moment, um, I believe that will have to reverse. And I've, I, we all know that we're hearing murmurs from the government about getting industry back up locally. You can see that I started my interest in electronics at a very young age, and I believe that all kids should be presented with a taste of every activity imaginable. Only then can they truly decide what is right for them. In fact, I can see parents, possibly they're here, um, who have been asked by their kids to buy them toolkits after attending one of our holiday workshops. So I certainly know that uh, a teacher up at the high school has got a fully equipped workshop now for his son who was um, at the Castlemaine Primary School when we were doing work there. That's me. My other hobby was photography in those days, black and white photography. So uh, that's one of the remaining pictures. I've been a lifelong radio amateur here I am at boarding school at 17, when I obtained my license, a uh, pass slip, should I say, because, because it wasn't until I was about 23 that I could afford any equipment and, and the license. But my teachers there were so supportive that they even joined my lunchtime radio club that I'd started. My career has always depended on my mostly self-taught electronic skills, which started with my being a technician in the BBC when I left school, setting up TV studios, and then extended to my eventual lecturing in the technical aspects of electronic music, my other passion. This is where I met Neil. Uh, we were doing um, a, a radio display at the uh, telegraph station and you came down. How did you hear about that? I think I read it in the paper. Oh, great. <laughs> yes. Publicity is great. Um, I've been an active member of Bendigo Amateur Radio and Electronics Club, Barrack, for over 10 years. I've participated in many support activities, publicity drives, and training events with Barrack, mainly involving school kids and scouts around the Bendigo Castlemaine area. Amateur radio is many things. People say to me, oh, you just talk to other old blokes about your medical conditions. <laughs> well, you know, I do sometimes. <laughs> but um, there's plenty more. These days, among many other things, we participate in a huge crowdsourcing effort that is used to study the ionosphere. 
We teach people the electronics behind it and we constantly innovate and develop new techniques. Now even the untrained eye can see that at 28 megahertz, signals need daylight to propagate and they are reflected by the ionosphere around the equator. You can see that's obviously there. So these sort of results are used by um, people who study the ionosphere. We've got thousands of people all around the world contributing to this scheme every day by plugging their equipment into the internet. We've got a Facebook page. Bendigo Barrack changed its name before I joined. And I heard this had happened because they wanted to include the word electronics. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I thought that um, was the reason because it was thought that amateur radio would not survive without attracting the interest of younger people who were just starting out on choosing their careers. And it wasn't universally popular. We lost some members as a result. And then Kevin, who was the president at the time, and Ross, who's here today, um, started holiday workshops. I mean, that's right, isn't it? Yep. And there's um, some pictures over there about that. Uh, th that. That happened at Heathcote, Bendigo, and Castlemaine. And then Ross, Mike, Des, Ian, David, and others continued. And again, I don't know, uh, I, wasn't, I didn't have much to do with it at that time, so I can't remember all of you who were participating, but uh, I've certainly got pictures of you all. And uh, all the while, some of our members were achieving Cert 3s and 4s in training and assessment, as that was needed to become assessors in the amateur radio exam, a requirement for obtaining a license. And Mike will talk about that next. Uh, forgetting to switch through. Here are brochures that we made. And uh, we got people from lo the local areas. Here's a uh, Mike and Ross at one of the classes at our previous club rooms in Bendigo. Well, I didn't help much, as I said, in the early days, but I used to bring along equipment, radio gear, quadcopters, and satellite communications equipment. And here we are outside this scout hall, um, attempting to pick up a, a satellite transmitting voices from much further than you can normally transmit, because there's a repeater in the satellite. You'll recognize this. The scouts of Mount Alexandershire have been very interested in what we have brought to them because of our assistance with JOTA. Now that stands for Jamboree of the Air, or on the air. And it's where radio amateurs all around the world help their local scout troops communicate with each other over the course of a weekend to earn their communications badges. And you'll see my collection of badges over there, which I appreciate. I haven't had time to stick them on my shirt yet. Um, Ross from Barrack became a leader in the Scouts and provided this chap with a copy of the radio training manual to spark his interest. We'll be hearing more about that in a, in a short while. Now, the funny thing was, I helped for three years with the uh, Scouts in Jota. And every year I said, if you want to become licensed, just say, and I'll help you learn and pass your exam. And then nothing happened. At the end of the third year, I got a phone call one day saying, you, you know, you said you're going to train us. I said, yep. Yeah. They said, well, could you start? And I said, yeah, when do you want to start? And he says, tomorrow. I booked a room. So, oh, okay. Anyway, we, we went to the bus station down in Castlemaine, and the, uh, uh, one of our amateurs uh, owned the business at the time, so we had uh, an office 
to use. And we also had David Farrell's bus. Now, David Farrell at the time was district commissioner for the Scouts, and he had a bus, a whole bus parked up at his location, uh, not, not a working one, I should say, and uh, we've got radio equipment in it. We ended up with Greg and David, the leaders, getting their license, and two of those venturers getting their license as well. So that was pretty good, and it led to the story over there, which the ABC made of us, which is still on the web, and uh, it's gone all around the world. People delight in talking about amateur radio on a bus in the bush, you know, keywords uh, to get people interested. Uh, I have to say that, of course, I only tra trained them basically. I sent them on to Barrack in Bendigo, where the proper assessors could deal with them. And that's how we work. They've got to be qualified to be assessors. Sometime later, parents at a local school, the Castlemaine Primary School, heard about my work with the Castlemaine Secondary College. I ran a, a radio club there for a couple of years, uh, one lunchtime a week during term, that sort of thing. And they asked me to start an electronics club at the school. Other members of Barrack joined me, including Ross and Neil, every Wednesday lunchtime for nearly four terms in 2019. And we have the principal here. Thank you for coming, Peter. Yuma here helped us every single Wednesday for that whole year, bar one day when she was ill at the end of it. And um, it, it meant we were talking to the kids on that day and they said, Where, where's Yuma? And they said, she's ill. And they, they all said, oh, we want, you know, they all wanted to become mentors uh, or uh, for the next group in the next year. They thought, we can help now, we're trained. You know, they'd, they'd spent 10 weeks building kits and uh, doing other experiments with us. But that, but that was 2019. So 2020, it all stopped. <laughs> Great. Mind you, the lockdowns and lack of face-to-face -face meetings has led to a resurgence in interest in amateur radio. And lessons learned about streaming media have led us to become skilled in including more people to our events who wouldn't normally be able to participate. And now we're using recently acquired high-tech equipment over there to continue to make training videos and uh, on our YouTube channel. So uh, from now on, we're going to start filming everything uh, so we don't have to repeat things. We can actually uh, correct, you know, make sure that the whole production is accurate. Social life in the amateur radio world has been improved by Zoom. We've got Zoom going at the moment for the people who can't get here tonight. Uh, we normally have, most of our meetings are held in Bendigo. And uh, I'll mention the Bendigo Club in a while. But um, this is a monthly coffee morning in the Castlemaine Park. And uh, once we were allowed to hold them again, we included a member in Bendigo, who's here tonight, uh, who had a a double knee replacement. <laughs> Not on the same leg, was it? <laughs> they didn't <laughs> mess it up. Two, two legs done there. Um, an ex Castlemaine member now in aged care in Maryborough. And good evening to you if you're tuned into us on Zoom. He, he does every month, join, joins our meetings. Um, and, uh, uh, and in this meeting here, it was, there was a hotel quarantine person in Adelaide who joined us, who's a friend of mine, and gave us, has been giving us talks on, the, uh, on Zoom for our meetings here. Now then, um, I, I'm going on now to talk about uh, 
briefly, hopefully we haven't got much more to go. So that we... Right. Many parents at other schools have asked me and asked us to um, start a soldering class, electronics class in their schools. But um, without us being able to train the trainers, in other words, training the teachers, parents and uh, other volunteers to do it, we cannot, uh, it cannot happen. It's spreading us too thinly. Now, Kerali from the Castlemaine Community House, CCH, has experience of our courses when her son attended one of our classes. So she asked me to help them apply for a major federal grant to set up a steam centre here in Mount Alexander Shire. I, I'm still yet getting used to the idea of calling it steam and not STEM, but it is accurate because the arts, uh, of course, is a significant um, uh, recipient of electronic expertise. So uh, we, we, we put together a grant application for a workshop in, that, in CCH's building. And subsequently, Barrick formed a partnership with CCH to provide in-kind services such as trained volunteers and course coordinators. Now, I, I particularly like the way CCH does its courses, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. We failed to get the grant. It was delayed, delayed, delayed because of COVID, then it, we didn't get it. So I offered to follow up other sources of support and I actually have been in contact with Lisa Chesters, the politician for our area, and uh, we had a Zoom meeting combined with Hugh, Barrack, and myself as a representative kind of, of CCH. Um, we had a Zoom meeting which sounded pretty um, positive, but, but uh, you know, still we've still got to work at it. I haven't had any real feedback. But CCH would provide an ideal venue for our training workshops for parents, teachers and other volunteers, which could be used by any other groups, including Q. Um, any, any course you can think of, they, they will put it on and they will work out a deal with you. Anybody who did wanted to do technical training. I do know that CCH is still interested in providing the umbrella organization for such a center in Castle Maine. And I think their model for supporting courses is great for trained people who wish to pass on their skills. I've enjoyed teaching many courses in that building for continuing ed uh, prior to CCH taking it over. But I do realize their difficulties with admin staff time, space, and lack of time slots for any new courses. They're pretty, pretty full. But without a workshop set out like an IT room with computers always set up, it all becomes too hard. And I've just heard from Q that you agree with me. You know, we can't carry around all these plastic boxes all the time and, and set up a workshop ad hoc. We need a home for it. More recently, I was invited by a radio amateur colleague to become a member of Castlemaine Electronic Workshop, which I was really pleased about because that's my other interest that I, I have spent last few words, uh, week, um, years at work, uh, working in a music department at a university and loving it, basically. And, uh, this group, Q, were, were aiming to provide support for performers and people interested in electronic music technology. And this demography is um, a different one to the one we specialize in. They've got children in primary schools around the place. So they're ideal candidates for training up, and some of them are already trained up, to be able to do this. So, you know, we can um, start a network here and uh, pass on all our skills to another generation. And so that's why I believe strongly that we can work together 
to uh, use the same facilities. We don't have to be interested in the same subjects, but in fact, there's a lot of radio amateurs who are in your group and your, uh, uh, people from your group in, as radio amateurs. So we definitely have got overlap there. Now, Barrack in Bendigo has recently been successful in being offered club rooms at the East Bendigo Hall near the swimming pool. And they're managers, we're managers of that building. And we don't pay rent, we pay electricity. So that's one way of getting uh, a building. And they, uh, we, I keep, we're all in this together, aren't we? <laughs> We've got a room there, which is going to be a steam training room. And it's got equipment. We've got some of it at the back there in, in those little cases. That's what we take around from school to school. But we've got equipment there. We've had a donation of 80 something PCs from the local TAFE. And um, it's going to be a, per a permanent steam center with uh, uh, using equipment donated or purchased with grants. But that's in Bendigo. And to sum up there, there, there are two separate but connected developments here in Alexander, Mount Alexander Shire that Barrack have been part of. So uh, this is what we've been doing so far. This is the, uh, the crux. The school-based learning program is already up and running in Castlemaine. So we've, we've actually done it and it's on a school by school basis. So we're, we're, we're forming arrangements with schools to equip them to teach the subjects and to attempt to train the trainers so that the schools can continue with this. And um, with the strong support of Peter McConnell, principal of Castlemaine Primary School, um, but we are looking to start to hand over the running of the, this to parents and teachers. We tried once before, got no takers. But we insisted that we can only be um, sustainable if the schools provide more people from their parents and uh, teachers to be able to run it themselves with our strong support, mind you, all the time. And you won't be alone. We won't uh, leave you alone to it. We've uh, hundreds of years of experience, as Neil has po pointed out. And I think, um, Hugh will be supportive of this initiative because it's in their uh, business, uh, in their priority list, as it were. Um, and as I said before, we've got parents who've, who've got kids in these schools already. I think, Lisa, you've got uh, two in um, Winters Flat. Is that right? Yes, that's right. But the, the, the bug in this is that the STEAM workshop where Barrack and Q would train people in various aspects of electronics and mechanics so that they can train others is still looking for a home. Notwithstanding a great offer to be discussed with Castlemaine Primary School. And I am still working with CCH to somehow make that centre a reality. So we're still pursuing that. Uh, what, we, what it would need, though, is um, a grant that would pay for a rental of another space that would become the workshop. Uh, we're thinking of the Tate building across the road from CCH. Um, so that they would, uh, that it would fund the building so that uh, CCH would have more rooms to uh, allocate to courses. It would pay for the admin time because they're uh, you know, um, Paul Kerrily is th three days a week there, flat out already. We need more money for admin time. And um, yeah, so so uh, that that oh, and equipment, of course, equipment. We need it equipped so that we can walk in at any time with a group of people who want to study and be able to just go get straight into it. So that's something we could do together. Um, we're all looking around for spaces to do that and we're lo all looking around for grants. But if we can show a united front, CEW and BAREC, then uh, we'll, be, we'll be stronger. 
Now then, I've got, to, I've got to admit something, that the whole reason I'm getting involved in all this is to encourage and to train another cohort of young people to be able and willing to continue the science of radio. I'm pushing amateur radio. And I know that once people, some of the people who get involved in electronics, such as Marcus, will want to become interested in radio amateur stuff. There's plenty to be interested in uh, that's a, of a very modern nature for younger people. So, um, you know, we basically, though, got to demonstrate this to them first. We've got to find somewhere we can demonstrate. We try it here and we do get success. Are there any questions? Well, thank you all for coming and listening to me. I believe um, Mike wanted to uh, say a few words. Uh, Mike's one of our uh, most highly respected and longest standing members. Uh, a veteran, if you can believe it, of the Apollo program. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Uh, I think it warrants some recognition that since uh, we commenced to work with the Australian Maritime College, and for those that don't know, if, uh, they are the university in Tasmania that now are responsible for issuing amateur licences. We have trained and assessed several candidates uh, at all levels of competency, and I'm pleased to advise that every candidate that we have examined has passed. It's my belief from discussions with AMC that we may be the only training facility that has thus far achieved 100%. This is due to three factors. Firstly, the expertise that both Graham and Neil bring to the training arena each week. Both gentlemen hold advanced amateur licences, Graham's expertise in logistics is unmatched. His approach to media keeps the trainees informed at all times. Neil's many years of experience with the SEC, workshop and then as a field supervisor installing antenna, often in remote Australian locations, brings a wealth of knowledge to uh, the amateur assessment. Secondly, week by week, they both produce lesser material in accordance with the training handbook and the VET syllabus material. It's not easy if you're going to run a uh, three or four hour uh, lecture uh, once a week uh, and uh, you've got to prepare that and you've got a syllabus you've got to prepare it from. It's no mean task and they did that week in week out. And thirdly, the establishment of phone or email uh, after hours tuition service allowed candidates to resolve problems and then continue on with further study that would, would stump them and lose valuable study time. And what we mean by that is that they could get on the phone or they could get on the email and they could ring either Neil or Graham and natter through a problem, get a resolution of it and continue on with their study. We are very pleased uh, with their achievements and I ask you to put your hands together and for a round of applause for our instructors. Now, this is the bit where we get to hand out the, the certificates to our graduates. So I'm, I'm not gonna draw this out too, too long. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be as brief as I can with it. Um, we've got a couple of people who are absent this evening. I believe one of our candidates is on Zoom and somebody else is an apology, is that right? Yes. Yes, okay. So um, we'll, we'll get to those in due course and there's surprises for certain candidates. Right, so we'll just go straight into it. And I'm not sure who's on the top here, so we'll just go one at a time. Stephen Briggs. <laughs> Congratulations, Stephen. Well done. Well done. Uh, Anthony Fitt is, is at home, isn't he? Yeah, he's on Zoom. Okay, Anthony, um, on Zoom. Congratulations, mate. We'll give this to you at the club rooms. Doug Craig. Where's he? Oh, he's, oh, he's the apology. Right, okay, fair enough. Well, that'll, that narrows it down a bit. Stuart Jamison. Oh. Congratulations, <laughs> Stuart. <laughs> Good job, mate. Thank you. Thanks very much. Tony De Groot. <laughs> Congratulations, Tony. Well done. 
Bibi Montague. And which one of those is yours? Congratulations, young lady. That's for you, and so is that. Well done. <laughs> John Adams. No, no, John Adams. Oh, that's right, he's a work. Oh. Some of us have to work. stay honest. Um, Daniel Makara. Congratulations, Daniel. Good job. Juliet Montague. Congratulations. There are very few mother and daughter combinations in the amateur radio community. But this is a new one. Luca Hines. Congratulations, Luca. Well done, mate. That's for you. And so is that. Thank you. Good on you. We're very proud of our juniors. They're just amazing. Uh, Luke Jopic. No. Apology. All oh, right. Fair enough. Peter Jardine. Congratulations, Peter. Good job. Thank you. And, oh, there's only two more. Sean Spencer. Oh. Congratulations, Sean. Good job. Cheers. And finally, Philip Hay. Another apology. Not here. Oh. Oh, oh, oh right. Fair enough. Okay, well. Yeah, we're just going to have to get those later. We probably need to also um, acknowledge um, Marcus as well, because Marcus did some training with us last year, and he's been at the forefront of the seventy as well. So uh, Marcus went through. Like, you went through AMC, didn't you? Oh, I had to leave. Yeah. So um, yeah. acknowledgement to uh, Marcus as well. He did our training last year. Yes, yeah, so you did it last year before we before we did all of this. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Yes, the, the, the ones that we've just uh, graduated all, all happened in the last six months as a concentrated, concerted effort to get as many people through as we could in a, in a structured course, uh, which was designed pretty much week to week. So that seems to have worked. And the assessments were during uh, February and March, yep. all of these graduates this evening, all went through February and March. And I'd, I'd just like to add my personal congratulations to Graham, who just drove himself into the ground doing the assessments. Good job. <laughs> oh, that's enough. That's <laughs> All right, that's the uh, formal part of the evening uh, finished. Um, there's food over there. There's uh, coffee probably boiling away by now. And um, feel free to have a look at all the projects that people have brought in. There's descriptions. Uh, you can ask any questions you like of any of, the, um, any of the people here. Just knock yourselves out. That's what we're here for. Thank you very much. Thank you.